So it's my uh, pleasure today to welcome Christy Remacall from University of Wisconsin-Madison. So Christy did her undergrad degree at MIT, finished 2003, mm -hmm. and then went to Berkeley and did her master's degree and PhD there with uh, David Sedlak, and then spent two years in Switzerland? Three. Three years in Switzerland with, uh, what do you need? Lights. Oh. Uh, with uh, our friend Chris McNeil as a postdoc, and I think was there during a time where uh, being paid in Swiss francs was very beneficial. It was. Yeah. It was nice. And she's won uh, several awards, including an NSF Career Award. And I'll turn the floor over to Christy. Sure. Thank you. Um, Bill, thanks for the introduction. And yeah, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I've been at Madison. This is the start of my fifth year, so it's nice to come over um, and finally have a chance to talk to you all. Um, today I'm going to talk about our work looking at photo degradation of lamprosides um, in the Great Lakes, and I'll tell you in a few minutes what all those things are. Um, first, a little bit more about me. I'm in civil and environmental engineering at Wisconsin. I'm also one of the core faculty in environmental chemistry and technology. This is an interdisciplinary program. Um, it's kind of unique to Wisconsin, so most of my students actually come in through this program, so they're chemistry students, um, so we kind of do a mix of environmental engineering and chemistry. Um, I told Bill I had to put in this picture here. Um, this is our building here, right on the lake. Um, it's really nice, nice spot, a little different than, I don't know, I like have to give Minnesota a hard time for this, so. Um, but yeah, if, if, if you've ever been to Madison, the terrace is right here. Has anyone ever been to the terrace? Yeah, if you've been there, it's a yeah, nice beer garden right on the lake. Maybe a little too close to the labs, like summers, there's no one there. But um, anyway, that's where we are if you ever come out to see us. Before I jump into my talk, I want to first just start by acknowledging my students, of course. Um, in particular, Megan here. Um, a lot of the work I'm going to show is her PhD work. Then we've also had a couple undergrads, Natan and Laura, who have contributed a lot to this project. Um, but yeah, you can see my group. We have a fun group of students there. Um, so, of course, they actually do all the work that I'm going to show. Am I okay with volume for you guys in the back? Okay. Okay, so first, I'm going to talk about um, what lamprosides are. So these are pesticides that are used to kill the sea lamprey. It's an invasive species that's found throughout the Great Lakes. Um, and then you'll see, I'll show you some pictures. You can see we're concerned about the environmental fate of these two chemicals. And so I'll show some work on laboratory studies, looking at how they photodegrade in like simulated sunlight. And then I'll show some work from a couple different field campaigns where we've actually gone out where they're adding these chemicals and try to see what happens out in the field. So that's the plan. Um, but let me first give you, put things into context in terms of what these lamprosides are. Um, and so these are pesticides that are used to kill specifically the sea lamprey. Um, so you have like the long name up there. This is an invasive species. It's found throughout the Great Lakes. Um, so it came over from the Atlantic Ocean and sort of as we, as we opened up different canals, it's kind of made its way west. Um, so it, it was found in Superior in 1938. Um, so has anyone heard of the sea lamprey before, some of you? Yeah, so the Great Lakes have a lot of invasive species. Um, the reason why this one is a concern is because it's a parasite. So yeah, scary fish pictures, always good. Um, so yeah, they have, they undergo a metamorphosis and they get this ring of teeth and they basically, they're parasitic, so they attach themselves to large fish. Um, so they've been really detrimental to you know, fish that we care about, so lake trout, walleye, catfish, and sturgeon, um, they've been really detrimental to fish populations. And so that's why there's been a really big effort to control the population of these fish. Um, and you can see this is, well, a little old now, 2013, but this is still an ongoing effort. So some data with fish. This is a commercial lake trout harvest versus time in Lake Superior in Michigan. And you can see in the 40s, 50s, things were going pretty good, and then there's this huge crash in the population. Um, for reference, this is when the sea lamprey were first observed, and then, yeah, there's that big decline. Um, obviously, there's a lot of other things going on here. There's, you know, other chemicals, you know, PCBs, pesticides, other things going on. Um, but the sea lamprey are definitely part of the problem that caused the decline in fish species in the Great Lakes. Um, a little bit more on fish. Uh, this figure shows sort of their life cycle. So they start out as like non-parasitic larvae. So these are yeah, just little tiny fish. They live in the sediments. 
Um, they live in tributaries, so the rivers all around the Great Lakes. And then after a couple years, they undergo metamorphosis, and that's when they get these scary teeth. And at that point, they go down to the Great Lakes, and then they feast on large fish. Um, then they return to the tributaries to spawn, to reproduce. And so the reason why I talk, I'm telling you this is because you know, they spend a lot of their life, both when they're really young fish, and then when they come back to reproduce, they spend their lives in the tributaries, so in the rivers. Um, and so that's why a lot of the efforts to control their population have focused on the rivers. That's also a lot more contained. You can think about treating a river versus the entire Great Lakes. So that's why we focused on the, specifically the tributaries. Um, to put it also in, in perspective, this is a, a map of the Great Lakes showing every dot on here is a tributary that is an, has a known sea lamprey population. So 450 tributaries. Um, this is an issue for both the US and Canada. Uh, it's just something like 8% of all the tributaries around the Great Lakes have sea lamprey populations. Um, so it's, yeah, pretty widespread. Okay, so made the case that these fish are kind of all over the place in the Great Lakes. Um, they're really bad for commercial fish, and so there's been a lot of effort over the years to try to control their population. Um, and so what's done? First, you know, they can, you know, they have, they're like salmon, they have to swim upstream to spawn. So they can put in barriers like dams and things like that to prevent them from swimming upstream. Um, this is obviously bad for other fish that also have to, native fish that have to swim upstream. Um, so this is sort of coming out of fashion. They try to trap them um, and then kill them. They release sterile males to de decrease their um, fertility or yeah, de decrease reproduction. Um, pheromones is really interesting. They're, they're actually recently in the last year, they, the EPA has approved a pheromone um, that is used to sort of, the, I think this one is a positive pheromone, so to sort of draw them into certain areas. Um, and then you can trap them there. But this is, yeah, I think an, an area of active research. This isn't widely used. Um, by far the most common method for controlling these fish are these two chemicals here. So um, in blue we have TFM, this 3-trifluoromethyl-4-nitrophenol. Uh, um, this is a chemical that's used in the highest concentrations. It's considered to be selective for the sea lamprey. So back in the 50s when they were testing it, they tested thousands of chemicals against the sea lamprey and native fish. And they found that this one was really good at killing the sea lamprey and not as good at killing other fish. Um, yeah, it's added, I'll show more data on this, but it's added, you know, tens of thousands of kilograms added every year. Um, so it's kind of a lot. Um, and then the other chemical is niclosamide. It's also a halogenated phenol, um, you know, bigger molecule, obviously. It is, was first mollusks, so um, that tells you right away that it's not species specific. Um, yeah, it's used for killing other things. It's also been used since the 60s. And they always add this one. Sometimes they add the two of these together um, in really large systems. This chemical is really expensive, um, so they'll sometimes add both. A couple more maps. This is data from Fish and Wildlife Service they shared with us. These are all the tributaries they treated in 2015. So it's 114 tributaries, so about a quarter of the infested um, tributaries. They treat them every three or four years. They'll go back and treat them again, um, so you can see kind of where they are. Again, it covers all the Great Lakes. And then in terms of mass of chemical applied, this is also fish and wildlife data. Um, yeah, these are pictures, well not this one, but the rest are pictures that I took. So this is a liquid TFM. You know, it's kind of scary. I mean, this really puts it in context. They're like these toxic chemicals that they're putting into rivers. Um, 100,000 liters of this added in 2015. Um, these are these bars. They'll put these, you know, the fish are really smart, so they're adding the chemical. Um, it has to, something I didn't say was that the chemical concentration has to be the minimum lethal concentration for about eight hours. So they add it as a block and the whole block of chemical moves downstream. Um, and the fish are smart and so they'll try to swim away. And so they'll drop these blocks of the chemical in small tributaries so the, the sea lamprey can't swim up to the little side tributaries. Um, yeah, these 700 bars. Different formulations of niclosamide, it can be granular or wettable powder or this like emulsified concentrate and you can see the numbers there. Um, but yeah, this is a lot of chemicals and unlike a lot of the chemicals that we study, these are like really added intentionally to the rivers. 
So a couple more pictures just to kind of drive that home. This is, I think, my favorite picture that I took. Um, in, this is up in September in Manistique in the UP. Yeah, I mean, this is like what it looks like. In this site, this was a small tributary, so they, um, I'll sh we'll come back to this later. This is, the Manistique River is really big, but they want that chemical concentration. It has to be at a certain concentration the whole time. Um, so they actually are in the field monitoring it, and they have different sites where they're boosting up the concentration um, to kind of keep it at the right level. So this is a spot, they're just boosting the concentration. They're adding, I think it was seven of these cans an hour. Um, for like 12 hours. Yeah, I mean, like that's what it looks like. Um, this side tributary was really clear, so you can see like the yellow color going in. Um, yeah, so that's, I mean, yeah, I think it gets a point across. You can see why we might care about what happens to these chemicals when they're out in the environment. So what happens? Um, well, we know some things. We know neither one undergoes hydrolysis, so they don't like decay on their own. They're not volatile, so they don't go into the air. Um, sorption is going to be more important, so like sticking onto particles is going to be more important for niclosamide. Um, we think it's going to end up in the sediments. It's pretty hydrophobic. TFM is more polar. Um, there's ongoing work looking at what happens to biodegradation. There's some studies that show that biodegradation can happen under some conditions. Um, this is still, like I said, there isn't as much known about this. And then when we started this project a few years ago, there was some limited data suggesting that photo degradation, so degradation by sunlight, could be important. Um, and so for the photochemists in the room, um, this is the absorption spectrum of niclosamide in orange and TFM in blue, and then our solar spectrum. So they absorb a lot of light um, in the solar spectrum, and so it is possible for them to absorb light and then photo degrade. So that's part of our motivation for this work is figuring out how important is this photodegradation process. Um, another part, and actually why we got funding to work on this was because um, the EPA has a registration review of pesticides every, I forget the number of years, seven or 10 years or so. And as part of that process, they required the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, which is the agency that applies the chemicals, um, to do a photodegradation study of niclosamide. And, um, yeah, I'd sort of come into the picture and they're like, hey, you can do this. And so we did this, we actually did this regulated study for them, um, which was resulted in like a 300 page report and like auditing. And it, it was a process um, to go through it. But I'm telling you this because it also sort of shaped how we did some of the experiments and some of the things that we were caring about. So the things that they require are looking at the degradation rate of this chemical as a function of pH. Um, so we do this in the lab, and then we need to take the lab data and calculate how fast that actually happens in sunlight. So that's the first part, just looking at how fast it degrades. Second part, they want a, us to identify and quantify any products that are greater than 10% of the concentration that we started with. So we basically have to do a mass balance on all the, the carbon. So we watch niclosamide going away, and we look at formation of products. Um, and yeah, so we're doing a mass balance. And you'll see we, these two parts are pretty easy, and these parts were actually pretty difficult. Um, so you'll see that. Okay, so I know some of you are photochemists, some of you are not. So just, yeah, photochemistry in three slides. Um, it kind of comes in two different flavors. So first is direct photodegradation. Um, so this, you know, here we have sunlight, reacts directly with our two compounds. I showed you they can absorb sunlight, they overlap with the solar spectrum and this can cause the compounds to degrade. So this is direct photolysis. Um, indirect photolysis, which I'll come back to a little bit later. Here, um, sunlight reacts with all the dissolved organic matter. So you can see this is a Manistique River. It's a little hard to tell, but this is a, a lot of carbon in here, something like 20 milligrams per liter, um, a lot of carbon, really dark. So all that organic matter absorbs light. It can produce a bunch of reactive species, so things like uh, singlet oxygen, hydroxyl radical, things like that. And then those reactive species can make our chemical breakdown. Um, so for today, I'm mostly going to focus on the direct photodegradation work. I'll show a little bit on the indirect photolysis um, here in a little bit. So for direct photodegradation. So we do these, um, a lot of our experiments, we use this solar simulator, or not a solar simulator, it's a rayonet. Um, the bulbs are like 365 nanometers, so it's within the solar spectrum. Um, it's a black light, so that's kind of fun. Um, but we, and it, you know, 
you guys are here in Minnesota, we're in Wisconsin, so we do this because we can do the experiments year round, reproducible, um, yeah, and things like that. So first we just looked at the degradation rate. How fast do these two chemicals go away? So this is TFM. This is the one that's used in the highest concentration. Um, the degradation rate versus the pH. So TFM degrades more slowly under acidic conditions and then the rate increases as the pH goes up. Um, so we can see that degradation rate is pH dependent. These rivers we're thinking about are mainly pH 8, pH 7, um, somewhere up there. Niclosamide, um, the one that also kills mollusks, has an opposite pH trend, so it degrades more quickly under acidic conditions. Um, and then you can also see that just the there's a big gap between these two. And so basically what that means is that TFM is going to degrade much more quickly than niclosamide will. So the one that is specific, specific for the sea lamprey, is going to degrade, degrade more quickly. Um, so like I said, this part's easy. We just look at how fast it goes away. And then the next part is, okay, what does it degrade into? Because we want to find out, is it degrading into things that could potentially be toxic or, you know, what, what do these chemicals look like? Um, yes, it's going to look a little scary, but um, this is what we figured out. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. Just to show you, there, there, it's complicated. There's a lot of pro products. Um, this is TFM up here, niclosamide here. They actually share some common products, which is interesting. Um, the main things are that we're going to lose our nitro groups, we're going to lose chlorine, and we're going to lose that uh, fluoral methyl group. So we're going to lose, for those of you that are chemists, we're going to lose like these really electronegative functional groups that are going to make things more persistent. Um, and so if we think about something like this out in the environment, that's not something we're really going to worry about as much. Um, so yeah, we can sort of build up this whole mechanism. So we can look for these products. These are all things you can buy. We can quantify these products, their concentrations. Um, if we think back to the EPA study, we're trying to do a mass balance on all these different chemicals. Um, and we basically weren't able to do it. So this is just niclosamide. This is niclosamide going away. And then these are the concentrations of all of these different photo products down here. Um, so we found a lot of products. Their concentrations are really, really low. Um, so what happens is that all of these intermediates also photodegrade. Um, so we did experiments with those. We built up a kinetic model, which are what these solid lines are. And then this gray line, this is our mass balance, like what we're not seeing. Um, so this was kind of sad. Um, <laughs> so I, you can zoom in. They are above zero, I promise. I know it doesn't look like it, but they are. Um, we also did like a full scan mass spectrum, just looking for everything, and we found over 30 different products with unique retention times, um, unique mass to charge ratios, and things that corresponded to things that we think have like, you know, three, four, five carbons, or, um, you know, we can see how many have nitrogen, how many have chlorine from the isotopic, the mass or the isotopic signature. Um, basically, we think there's a lot of ring cleavage going on. So once this first step happens, um, things, everything else photodegrades and it kind of falls apart into a lot of different things. Um, so from the EPA's point of view, their mass balance, this is not very good. Um, so we're like, okay, well, it's losing, this has, it's losing chlorine, it's losing this nitro group. Well, can we look for like chloride and nitrate in solution? Um, so our argument in our EPA report, which has been there for a year or more, and someday we'll hear back from them, them was like, okay, we can do a mass balance with these things. So niclosamide has two chlorine atoms on it. Um, here we can look at niclosamide going away. These are all our chlorinated organic products, which I promise are above zero. And then this is chloride forming in solution. Um, this white line, this is our mass balance, and this is what we should be. So we're, we're pretty close. We can, if we're just looking at the parent and looking at chloride forming in solution, um, we can get pretty close to a mass balance. Um, over here, similar, niclosamide going away and nitrite, nitrate building up in solution. Um, so we can see evidence of losing, again, the, the chlorine and the nitro groups on our compound, which is good for environmental persistence. Um, TFM is a little bit better behaved. You know, we can at least see some of these products. Um, gentisic acid is the big one. Same thing, it produces fluoride, it produces nitrate. Um, they behave sort of similarly. Um, take home message, we're losing the halogens, we're losing the nitro groups, and you know, we, we sort of have a sense that when that happens, these are things that we're not going to be as concerned about in the environment. 
Um, relating this data to the field, um, we did some calculations with half-lives. Like, so that's how long does it take for half of the chemical to degrade by sunlight. Um, I hate showing tables and talks, but that's the best way for this. So TFM at the surface of the water column, we're talking an hour, a couple hours. If you integrate over depth, so you, know, you can imagine there's a lot of light at the top of the water, a lot less light as you go deeper. If you integrate over um, a certain depth, in this case 55 centimeters, here we're talking something like 20 hours of full sunlight. Um, so for TFM, which again is more selective for the sea lamprey, it's going to be less persistent. It is possible for photodegradation to happen. Niclosamide, I mean, yeah, hundreds of days, full sunlight, that's slow. Um, we're, we're not expecting to see photodegradation of that one happening through direct photodegradation. Um, a little bit on indirect photolysis, which again, which is this dissolved organic matter mediated route. Um, so because dissolved organic matter produces these reactive species, we hypothesized that adding dissolved organic matter would make photodegradation happen faster. So you have that direct rate and then the indirect rate on top of it. Uh, I'm just going to show a couple slides on this just to give you a sense this is still ongoing work. But um, for niclosamide, here this is the rate versus the dissolved organic carbon concentration. You can see as you add more organic matter, the, indirect, the photolysis rate increases. And so for niclosamide, which is the one that degrades really slowly, um, having dissolved organic matter is going to make it degrade a little bit more quickly. Um, so this is Pony Lake, fulvic acid, you know, Swanee River fulvic acid, so our isolates, and then some rivers in Wisconsin. And I was really lazy and didn't update this graph, but we have um, a lot of other da more data, and it shows sort of the same trend um, for rivers all around Wisconsin and Michigan. Um, for, so niclosamide, adding dissolved organic matter did increase photodegradation. For TFM, it, it doesn't. Um, TFM isn't susceptible to indirect photolysis. Um, yeah, it, direct photolysis is going to be the major route. Um, so sort of, yeah, a lot of things like what Bill does in his group, we're looking at which of these different reactive species are important. Um, I'm not going to go into this. I can talk about it more later, but we're seeing it looks like um, they react pretty quickly with carbonate radical, which is kind of interesting. Um, and that looks to be pretty important for these two compounds. Okay, so that's all lab data. Um, we can do lab you know, experiments in the lab all the time, and that's great, but we want to see does this actually happen when we go into the field. Um, and so I'm going to show data from a couple different field campaigns. The first was, they're both in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. The first was last summer. Up these two, these are small rivers, they're creeks, Sullivan Creek and Carpenter Creek up in the UP. Um, these are maps, Fish and Wildlife Service maps. Um, these, ones, these treatments are really simple. They're like about a mile or so in length. So the red line, the green point is where they add the chemical, and the red line is a treatment zone. And these ones I'm saying are really simple. They just add the chemical once, and that's it. I'll show you the Manistique River in a little bit, and you can see it's, I don't know, it's a whole different animal. Um, these ones are really simple. It's really short. Um, we did that because we were working with um, a hydrologist, Adam Ward, at Indiana, and um, we're also doing a tracer experiment at the same time. Well, not the same time, the, same, the next day. Fish and Wildlife wouldn't let us dump in a bunch of salt with their chemical. Um, so we had to go back the next day, which is, doesn't help. But um, basically, you know, one day they'd add TFM, the lamprocide. Um, we'd sample right below where they added it and also right before it entered the lake. And we're trying to quantify how much mass of TFM is lost. Then the next day, we'd go back with sodium bromide, um, a, like a, a salt tracer. Again, add it at the same spot, measure right below, measure right at the lake, quantify how much mass of salt was lost, and then compare those two and see how much of our TFM was lost to like physical processes, like exchange with the groundwater, versus how much was lost to like photodegradation. Um, and yeah, some pictures out in the field. This is our Fish and Wildlife Service um, employee. There's your you know, skull and crossbones picture there. Um, and there's like a pump here and basically a drip line. This really, really small system, um, really shallow, which is going to be good for photo degradation, but really there's a lot of trees, so that's not going to be so good. Um, here's my student, Megan, mixing up a vat of sodium bromide in a trash can and then dumping it into the river. So very you know, robust field equipment, I guess. Um, so yeah, this is what that looks like. 
And then we have a couple students here, Robin and Juno, um, an undergrad in my lab. Yeah, downstream, you can see this is Adam. You know, they added the salt and then they're like frantically sampling, like to try to catch this plume of um, salt that they add coming in. Then we analyze this, we kind of run the whole gamut. So we have a sond here, it's looking at pH, temperature, you know, things like that. Um, we're gonna do uh, dissolved organic carbon, looking at the DOM a little bit with UV spectroscopy. We're gonna look at ions. Um, Yo Chin, you guys know Yo, some of you, lent us his radiometer. We're looking at sunlight during these experiments. Um, and then, well, this is our HPLC, but also HPLC and uh, the mass spec, we're gonna look for TFM. In this case, they're just adding TFM, that's the lamprocyte that's more selective for the fish, and gentisic acid, um, which is the main photo product. So we're gonna look for those. First, let's look at the salt data. Um, I'll show a couple of these figures. This is just that solar flux from their radiometer. So the, the day we added the salt was a nice sunny day. You can see some of the other days it was raining, um, which isn't good for photochemistry. Um, so this is a shallow river. It's about you know, half a foot to a foot deep. Um, this is our data from right downstream where we added the sodium bromide, this huge spike in concentration. I mean, you, you think about dumping that trash can in. Um, downstream by the mouth of the river, you know, we can see this big plume. Um, you can see my poor students sampling frantically to <laughs> get this nice data, but we can quantify how much of the salt was lost from the two different, two different places. Um, for TFM, Again, I mentioned for these, the TFM additions, with, for all these lamprosite additions, they want to maintain a mi minimum lethal concentration for a fixed amount of time. It's usually eight or nine hours. Um, so you can see TFM, we didn't quite catch the first part of it, but you know, it builds up quickly. They're trying to maintain the steady concentration for about eight hours, and then it turns off again. Um, so this is upstream. You can see the concentration there. And then downstream, you know, this is, the difference is the travel time it takes to go from upstream to downstream, and then we can measure the concentration there. Um, so we do kind of a mass balance, add up how much TFM was lost. For this creek, we found, you know, we lost about 34% of our TFM, but we also lost about 30% of our sodium bromide. Um, so those are about the same. And so that means that the amount of TFM we lost is due to physical processes like exchange with the groundwater rather than degradation. Um, we also looked for photo products and didn't find any. And so we're like, okay, you know, the sort of, the tracer study tells us that nothing's happening and then we're not seeing any photo products. Okay, well, that is what it is. It's field work, right? And so that's the result that you get. Um, Sullivan Creep, the other system, I'm not going to show any data for it. It's the same, exact same story. This river's a little deeper, a little wider, a little more sunlight exposure, um, but we saw the same thing again. So what does that tell us? Um, well, it tells us in these really small systems, the TFM that you add is going to make its way out into the Great Lakes. Um, in retrospect, this was not surprising. Um, you know, of course, we did all of our calculations and math from going from our lab data to our field data, maybe a little bit too late, and in retrospect, we're like, okay, yeah, you know, the waters, you know, these are a mile long, so the, the, the chemical just isn't in the river long enough to see enough sunlight, so that's, it's not too surprising, so, again, hindsight is 2020, but that was a result that we got here. So then we thought, okay, you know, go big or go home, right? We're going to go to the, pretty much the biggest river that they treat. We want to, we picked a site where they're adding, the chemical's going to be in the, the water for days. Um, and we go back to our calculations, we're like, okay, we're expecting to see some degradation here. So this is the Manistique River. Um, this is a huge river, as you can tell from the picture. Um, it's up here in the UP. Um, this one feeds into Lake Michigan. And so remember that the map that I showed you of those two creeks, or it was just like that single addition and like that dot? Um, this is the treatment zone of the Manistique. So, um, this is a huge map, so let me just walk you through it. So these red lines, these are all the areas where they're treating with lamprosides. The red dots, these are the first points where they added the chemical. Um, and then you, it's, I didn't make them bigger, but the purple ones are where these are the um, verification points. So they're actually going into to the field to measure the concentration. Again, they're something that really like, made a big impression on me from going out to these camp 
applications is that they're really careful with what they're doing. So they want to get the concentration that's high enough, but not like so high. Um, so they're, they're out there, they actually have mobile HPLC trailers where they're measuring the chemical as it's moving downstream. Um, in this case, they're using both TFM and niclosamide, so both, both chemicals. I'll show you a picture of it. It's like, it was really cushy field sampling. Uh, it was pretty nice. Um, but they're measuring the chemical, and then these green ones, these are places where they're adding more chemical. So as you know, some of the chemicals lost to degradation or physical exchange processes are bumping up the concentration. Um, and it's just amazing, because they're, they're wanting, you know, they're adding it at all these different spots and basically wanting it to all meet together at the same time. Um, so they're out there for 10 days. I think they had field crew, like five different field crews that like filled up every hotel in town. Like, um, it was an impressive operation. And the poor woman who was like running the whole thing was like, on the radio every time we were out, like 24 hours a day. Like it was, it was impressive, um, just the logistics. Um, so that's where they added it. This is where we sampled. Um, so we had three sites where we sampled and then Fish and Wildlife was really generous and let us sample from the, they had ISCO, so automatic samplers, um, which again was really cushy sampling because they basically were like, here are 24 hours of sample at four different locations. But we're sampling this whole re reach. Uh, this is the main stem of the Manistique. By the time we're down here, the chemical had been in the water for about uh, three and a half days. Um, so this is, it had been going for a while. Couple pictures again. Um, this is one of the sites uh, where they were, you know, upstream of the water, they're measuring the concentration and then of this bridge, and then downstream they had a feeder going across, and they're adding a more chemical. Um, and then you had your, this is our mobile lab, which is nice, because it was, you know, the middle of the night and raining, so it was really nice that they let us sit in there for filtering our samples. But they have their little UV vis. This is for measuring TFM. That one's their um, 10 micromolar concentration, and then the HPLC for measuring niclosamide. Um, yeah, so they had, I think, four of these in this treatment system. Um, it was quite an operation. But yeah, so one other thing that made a big impression on me was that the chemist was in here, like, telling everyone what to do, which is kind of nice. So. You know, he was measuring, you know, the concentration, then he was telling the people adding the chemical, okay, add it at this flow rate, okay, now we're good. Like, I don't know, it, like I said, the, just the control and precision that they were doing, it was very impressive. Okay, so big system, what does this look like? Um, this is TFM. So this is when they started adding, and then this is, these are our data. So we can watch TFM coming up, you know, all these different places. You can see it sort of drops off. This is the West Branch coming in. Um, but you can see, I mean, just look at the concentration. So we're like 9, 10 micromolar. Yeah, for those of us that do trace level work, like, I mean, we don't need to do any concentration. You can just, it's, you can just measure it. It's, you can see it. There are some of the old guys who say, like, they can, like, kick the stream and, like, by seeing the color on their boot tell you the concentration. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, but you can see we, get, we got a pretty nice spread of data as the chemical moved downstream um, looking at that. So this is TFM. Um, they also added niclosamide, the one that's also for killing mollusks. Again, they do that because TFM is expensive and they're, they're trying to decrease the amount of chemical they're adding, so they add niclosamide as well. This data is really messy. Um, you know, they're adding here, are, you know, you know, nanomol or ten to nanomol or sort of concentration. Um, I think this data is fish and wildlife data that they were collecting in the field, and then the other data is our data. Um, I don't know. I think the difference is that we're filtering our samples and they're not. Um, so it's, it's a pretty hydrophobic chemical, so I think that's why. Um, that's what it looks like. So these are the two pesticides, the two lamprosides, and we're like, okay, let's look for photo products. Um, and that's really boring because we didn't see any, um, which is disappointing, obviously. So. Residence time here was over three days. You know, we calculated a half-life of 20 hours at this pH. Um, but then you can start to see like, okay, we have to, you know, put a star on this. This assumes full sunlight, so 20 hours of noon, noontime sunlight. We calculated this in Madison, so further south in July. These data were collected in September, or yeah, September. This was at a depth of 55 centimeters. This river was more like two meters. Um, so you can start to see, okay. It doesn't take very much to kind of get to a number that makes sense um, for this system. So yeah, so some of the factors that affect photolysis rates, so going from the lab to the field, pH, 
you know, I showed you that pH dependence. Um, you know, we can pick our pH 8 data. That's easy to do. Um, we can think about light intensity. So, you know, if we did our calculations for down here and we're up here, we can correct our data for that. Um, depth, you know, 55 centimeters versus 2 meters. We think about photodegradation rates decreasing, like, exponentially with depth. If you integrate over 2 meters, that's going to be a much lower number. Other factors that are harder to come into play, well, you know, has about 20 milligrams carbon per liter. We can think about light screening, um, you know, where the, the organic matter is basically preventing light from penetrating very deep in the water. And then, you know, the, the weather looks like this. It was cloudy this whole system, this whole time. So all these things, you can take all this into account and come up with a, a number that you're like, okay, maybe it's not surprising that we didn't see any photodegradation in this system. Um, so the next part of this is, okay, well, we know we see it in the lab, but under what conditions might we actually expect to see it? And so, um, you know, my poor student is graduating soon, and while it would be awesome to go out and sample a bunch of different treatment systems, um, we, we can't do that. So we're going to do some modeling. And we're going to take some, you know, the far southern point that they treat and the most northern point. Um, you know, this is sort of modeled sunlight at these two different locations. And we can basically come up with ranges of half-lives. Um, so I think the one I just want to walk you through the most, which is I think the most interesting, is this one, which is TFM half-life at different depths. So at the surface of the water column, it's going to be an hour or something like that. When we're out here to two meters, we're going to get half-lives, you know, tens, 50, 100 hours. Again, this is full sunlight. Um, like imagining the sun shining, like noontime conditions for, for 100 hours. Um, so we can sort of, taking this data and what we're doing now is taking that with fish and wildlife data for like what tr streams they treat, how big they are, how deep they are, and like trying to figure out how often we would expect to see this happening. So that's what we're doing now. Okay, so to wrap that up, um, yeah, we're looking at these two chemicals, TFM and niclosamide. So yeah, I said my favorite picture, um, the chemicals being added. In the lab, we're seeing that they undergo photo, or pH-dependent photodegradation, um, and that TFM is going to degrade much more quickly than niclosamide. We see that photodegradation is fairly slow, but when it does happen, we think the main products are things that we're not going to be as concerned about in the environment because they lose the halogen groups. Um, dissolved organic matter changes things. Um, TFM does not undergo indirect photolysis, whereas niclosamide does. And then, you know, in the field products, the field campaigns, we didn't see any photo products. Um, and so, you know, we know what happens in the lab, and we're trying to think about when it might actually happen in the field. And so, to think about some implications, um, this is a picture. I didn't put a card out. This is a, someone drew this in one of those mobile lab trailers at this last field campaign. Um, but, I mean, this is, yeah, I mean, you have to think about the costs and benefits. Like, I mean, a lot of us are concerned about chemicals in the environment, um, obviously, but these fish are really detrimental to big, you know, commercial fisheries. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a cost benefit. And like, I mean, we have to sort of think about the whole picture. And we know even in like these big systems, I guess I didn't say this, but in the Manistique, you know, they're adding the chemical as it moves downstream. They're adding it at the very mouth of the river. So even if photodegradation does happen in the systems, there's still chemicals getting out into the Great Lakes. Um, so one thing we're doing, we have some cores, a colleague is sharing with us from Lake Michigan wanting to see like, yeah, especially niclosamide's pretty hydrophobic. We think they've been using it for 60 years. Um, we would expect to see some of it in the sediments. So, um, yeah, I'm going to stop there. I want to first acknowledge there's Megan holding a sea lamprey. They're just so gross. <laughs> um, I think she took that picture just to mess with me. But, um, yeah, Laura's an undergrad. She's graduated now. And then Natan. Um, Terry at USGS has done, I mean, they did all the auditing for the EPA study, and he's been a really big asset. Steve is like the, the fish and wildlife chemist um, who shared his nice trailer with us and helped us. Um, Steve and Sean, I mean, we couldn't have done this field work without them because they're really helping us, telling us, you know, when to sample, where things are coming, really helpful. And then Adam's our hydrologist, um, and then funding from different agencies. So thank you all for your attention. I'll answer any questions. Uh, so in your 
field study, did you consider the possibility of biodegradation? We um, didn't look for that specifically. Um, I think in the short systems, the, the mass balance tells us enough that it's not happening. Um, like I said, part, as part of that EPA registration process, they, were, they requested some new photo or biodegradation studies. Um, so like I said, that's still ongoing. It's not very clear how often that happens. I think there's some studies showing it happens under anaerobic conditions, so in the absence of oxygen. Um, yeah, I think that's probably, my sense is from the data that's available that that is gonna be a little slower than the physical transport time. But yeah, that's a good question. But the, um, the niclosamide indirect stuff, did you guys do product analysis there? To see if the products are different? Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't done it yet. Because I wonder if, you know, when I think about what's happening here and you're saying it's going to get into the Great Lakes, but then these things are going to degrade anyway. If and when it, you know, let's say the TFM gets into the Great Lakes, it's going to photodegrade and those are all eventually going to be photolabile too. Mm -hmm. But I bet those indirect carbonate radical mediated ones are different. more stable mm -hmm. and more hydrophobic and might persist. And so even though it's lower, those mm -hmm. might be ones that you could, if you're going to go into the sediments, I wonder if those might be things you could look for there too. Yeah, to see that's, evidence a, of it. that's a good idea. Um, yeah, we haven't done too much. This is, yeah, sort of the last bit that we're working on. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've measured like carbonate radical rate constants um, and they, re they degrade pretty quickly, but that's something that we'd like to do. Okay. Christy, does anyone know what the effects of these compounds are ecologically? Just because a niclosamide looks, from my perspective, really nasty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you would wonder if, if it would have, I mean, it's clearly getting into the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I mean, your sediment studies will be really interesting, but, but what are these things doing to the, to the ecosystem? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know, and I, I, yeah, I'm so not a biologist. Um, <laughs> But from what I know with fish, like with TFM, like it's specific for the sea lamprey, but it, the reason it can't clear it out, it's like a really ancient fish species, um, so it just can't clear it out. There are other native lamprey that have the same mechanisms. Um, niclosamide, though, I mean, it kills mollusks. It's used for all sorts of other things. So I think that one, like you said, it's pretty nasty. I think that's a concern. Just for some historical context, I remember reading about uh, TFM in some government brochures while sitting in the water chemistry lab in the mid-1960s mm -hmm. as a graduate student. Mm -hmm. um, but the disconcerting news, if we needed any more this week, uh, from your study is obviously uh, these chemicals haven't been totally effective in wiping out the, the, the lamprey. Uh, they've been used for over 60 years, as you say. Mm -hmm. How much of effect have they had? Yeah, that's a great question. That's something that I sort of wonder, like, why don't we just, like, blast everything, like, go out for a couple years and, like, just treat everything and get rid of them? Um, I think it's not, yeah, you're right, they haven't eradicated the species. It's sort of just, like, maintaining them at kind of a steady concentration. Um, I think, yeah, from talking with, like, fishery biologist, this is really hard because it just takes one spawning female to repopulate a whole stream. Um, the manistique, you know, most, most of these systems they treat every three or four years. Um, this one they treated two years ago and they had to go back and treat it again two years later. Um, and so you think about, I mean, five crews of people out there for 10 days, the cost um, that go into that play, it's, it's not 100% effective. Um, I think that's a really good point. Like, yeah, they've been doing this 60 years. Um, I don't think there's any sign of it going away anytime soon. Um, <clears throat> I was, so you, it's quite clear with your research that these chemicals are going to get into the Great Lakes. I was wondering what your research would allow you to project as far as what happens in the Great Lakes. Yeah, that's a good question. We haven't um, focused too much on that. I mean, obviously when you get onto the Great Lakes, the water is going to be much more clear. It's going to be a lot deeper. Um, so we would expect to see more photo degradation happening on the surface. Um, but yeah, you have to think about, yeah, physics. I mean, it's just going to be completely diluted. Um, so the photo zone is going to be deeper, but there's a lot of the lake that doesn't see light. Um, yeah, that's a good question. We haven't, like I said, that's, I think, why we want to look in the sediments, because I think some of it's going to end up there. It's my sort of gut feeling. Uh, yeah, I just had sort of piggybacking on Paige's question. Um, so you said they, oh, sorry. So you said they can't clear it out, the mm -hmm. TM 
TMF, right? TFM. Or right. TFM. Um, is it narcotic toxicity or is it specific? Because it's selective. But mm -hmm. is it selective because they can't clear it out or is it selective because it's a different mode of action? Uh, my understanding is, is it's selective because they can't clear it out. Okay. And then is that the same case? Because you uh, mentioned that the other one is, is hydrophobic. Is mm -hmm. that... It's, Since it's, I think it's, I believe it's a different mode of action for okay. nucleosamide. Okay. Yeah. Hi, so this is kind of pig, piggybacking off of Tim's question. Yep. Have you looked at surface water concentrations in the Great Lakes for these? Mm -mm. No, we've been really focused um, on, the, on the tributaries because that's where they're adding the chemical. Um, again, if I, my graduate student was going to stay longer, I think that's something I'd like to go to. But yeah, at the moment, we haven't done that yet. I'm going to ask the next one. Okay. Uh, for your <laughs> nitrogen mass balance, mm -hmm. obviously it's not complete. No. Uh, do you worry about kind of NOx type species coming out? Or, I mean, nitrite and nitrate it themselves can photodegrade off into other things. Mm -hmm. Have you tried looking for the gas species or something else they might form? We haven't done that. Um, we know, I mean, we've, like a lot of these like unknowns or whatever the masses we identified um, have odd nominal masses, so that tells us they have one nitrogen atom in them. So we think a lot of these photo products that we haven't identified do contain nitrogen. I mean, that nitro group is I mean, it's hard to knock off. Um, it's really electronegative. So I think a lot of the organic products do still have nitrogen. Um, so my hunch is that that probably explains most of it, but no, we haven't looked at the air. Hey, um, thank you for your amazing presentation. It doesn't amplify, it's just recording. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my question is, um, you just mentioned like uh, the uh, nicolosamide uh, is more uh, uh, susceptible, susceptible to uh, for photolysis under, uh, like in the presence of DOM, <coughs> but TFM was not. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think you mentioned that uh, the reason why this uh, uh, photo, uh, photo, photolysis is uh, better for uh, nicolosamide is better is that uh, there's some uh, hydroxyl radicals or other uh, reactive agents uh, uh, informed, uh, like, like induced uh, mm -hmm. under uh, the presence of UM. But uh, how come this, this is different, like TFM was not effect, uh, increased, the degradation of TFM? Yeah, it's interesting, because we've measured the um, rate constants for a reaction with both compounds of like hydroxyl radical and carbonate radical, and they both react with these different radical species. Um, I think it's a sort of a balance between, yeah, the DOM, like, well, so dissolved organic matter can do different things. It can increase photolysis rates through these radical formation. Um, it can, like, act as, like, an umbrella and, like, screen to, like, absorb light. Um, and it can also act as an antioxidant, so actually um, cause decreased photodegradation rates. And so, I think it's just a balance for TFM of these different processes happening because we know it does react with like carbonate radical and hydroxyl radical, but it, I think maybe that antioxidant um, behavior comes into play. Last one here. Okay. Um, I I just wondering the um, the experiment you did with the direct photolysis. Uh, do you look into the intensity of light and the effect that it can have in the product formation? Um, no, most of the ex experiments. Well, we did two different. I showed the rayonet, um, which is a really intense light source at 365. We also do this with like a xenon lamp, so closer to like a solar simulator, and we see similar results with those. Is there a reason why you would think that? No, I guess thinking on lines like a, depending on like a, I'm assuming, and maybe I'm wrong, uh, depending on the intensity of light, you might have my clothes that will be more lift, mm -hmm. a lot of lift in the reaction. Mm -hmm. It might be worth it to look at those, like, uh, especially in the rivers where you want to have so many different lights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we haven't seen that using these two different light sources. Interesting idea. Okay, let's thank Christy once more. Okay, thanks, you all.